Thank you all for coming. I'm Phil Nash, developer advocate at JetBrains. And I'm Simon Brand, developer advocate at Microsoft. And today, we're going to talk to you about error handling in C++, because what, what could possibly, possibly go, go wrong? wrong? <laughs> Actually, there is one thing, just to address the elephant in the room, first of all. Who here went to Andre Alexandrescu's talk yesterday? Quite a few, thought so. Because uh, definitely similar subject matter. And we are going to cover some of the same ground. So don't get put off, because we're going to go off this in different directions. And you could say we're going to go quite a bit beyond what, uh, what Andre talked about. So uh, we've also got a slightly different presentation style. So yeah, just to set started. expectations. Exactly. OK, so what is an error? Very philosophical question for us all. If my clicker decides to work. Uh, why is my clicker not working, Phil? This is why we should have used my laptop. No, if we'd done that, it would have all been OK. This is why we call the talk, what could possibly go wrong? Everything can go wrong in a technical talk. Now my clicker is working. What is an error? <laughs> so an error could be a number of things. Could be something like this. Something went wrong. What is something? Well, maybe something like this. Bean creation, not allowed exception. Something to do with destroying factories. Maybe some of us kind of get an idea of what this might be. But if you're not the target audience for this error, maybe you're just a non-technical user of this tool, then maybe your reaction something like this. You know, I try and use your tool, and currently, <laughs> saying like, I'm destroying bean factories. What's this about? So if we don't craft our errors and our messages correctly, we get misunderstandings. We want our error messages to be correct for the audience they're designed for. There's also a problem, some bugs can be really hard to see. Some errors can be hard to see. Sometimes we just throw away our errors without ever looking at them. And this causes problems. Some more issues with errors. Sometimes we're disappointed. You know, it's not an error, nothing like went catastrophically wrong, but something like we maybe planned for, but we're just a bit disappointed when it goes wrong. You know, I couldn't find this file. It's not the end of the world, but you know, I'm just a bit disappointed. So the happy path. If something goes right, you know, fantastic. You know, we've got this lovely sunshine, you can stroll down, it's all great. What about if something goes wrong? Yeah, what's the opposite of the happy path? So I, would, I would have thought the opposite of happy is sad, so maybe the sad path? What do you think? I know, it's a bit morbid. Um, I think yeah. maybe a bit more descriptive would just be call it the error path. OK, all right, we'll go, we can for go that. with that. But we're, we're talking about errors. That's the, the subject of the talk. And of course, there's all sorts of different types of errors we could be dealing with. I'm sure you've seen plenty of these. I want to start <laughs> by looking at a few different types. Here's one that you've, uh, you've probably seen plenty of times, although you shouldn't. Uh, I know I've written this so many, many times, and my users have seen it, so they shouldn't do. Because sometimes you know, things shouldn't happen if everything is going correctly, but, but they do anyway. We, we, we need to have a strategy for dealing with that. Uh, that's the first of, uh, in fact, before we go on to that, a beautiful moment of irony when I was originally preparing these slides, exactly this point, Keynote crashed on me and gave me the stack dump. Uh, fortunately, I uh, started up again and got my slides back. But uh, yeah, th these things happen. We have to deal with them. But there's two other categories of errors as well, as well as the, the should never happen type. We've got things that shouldn't usually happen, but you know, they, they can genuinely occur, and we do need to allow for them. And then the, the final category is the things that that might happen, but if they do, they're going to be a bit disappointing, as Simon says. We'd prefer it if they didn't, but we definitely have to allow for them. Let's put some examples to this. In the should never happen category, we've got the nullly reference, out of range access, use after free. You know the type. They're, they're definitely uh, things that should never happen in well written code. What's interesting is the should never happen category. Uh, there's one great example for this one. And that's out of heap memory. 
uh, new or malloc uh, return to failure. You know, it very rarely happens in practice, but it's, it's a genuine thing that can happen. And then the final category, some examples there, and if you can read that down there, file not found, can't convert from a string, couldn't look up a key in a map. Lots of examples I'm sure you can think of, of things that, uh, that they could definitely fail, and we'd be disappointed if they did, but you know, we can carry on, we can, we can work around that. And in fact, that sort of leads us on to another way of looking at these. Group them into some different buckets. So we've got logic errors, the, the should never happen category. Uh, they're logic errors because the errors are coming from the code itself. They're in the code. They're bugs. The only thing we can say about them. But as well as errors that come from within the code, we've therefore got errors that come from outside the code, they must be caused by I.O. Or, or side effects. And really, that must be the only two ways that we can, we can look at errors, from within the code or from outside the code. But how does the out-repeat memory fit into that? You know, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. Because it, it doesn't really fit into the, either of those categories. It's not a bug as such, but it's not really caused by I.O. in the sense that we normally think of it. And I think there's a really good case for treating out of uh, heap memory errors as a special case, something that we don't really deal with with our normal error handling strategies. But I think it's often the, um, the whole problem when we're dealing with errors is we're trying to work around dealing with out of heap memory. When in practice, it very rarely happens. So if we took that out of the picture, as for the moment, we're just left with logic errors and IO errors. And another way we can think about those is that logic errors are not recoverable because your program is in a corrupt state. It's uh, something you didn't anticipate, all bets are off. So if you carry on at this point, then you know, just as likely to, to corrupt the file system or um, do anything, that's the point. You don't know what state you're in anymore. The only thing you can really do is to stop at that point and give as much information as you can. By contrast, recoverable errors are recoverable. You, you anticipate them, you know they can happen. You'd rather they didn't, but you can work, you can work with that, you can carry on. So they're really the two categories that we're, we're going to look at. So what actually should we use to deal with non-recoverable errors? Another great question. So there's a proposal in flight for uh, support for contract-based programming in C++, and that's exactly what this is all about. So I encourage you to go and read this. Um, P038R1 at the moment. Um, it's a great paper. It's, uh, I think it's already been accepted into uh, C++20. Uh, just some details to iron out. Now, if you, if you don't have access to C++20 yet, we can achieve most of the same things just by using a cert. That's really all, all it is. Or you can build your own um, system that does something similar. Really, the important thing is that we just want to stop execution of the program when we, um, when we hit one of these errors and give as much information as you can about what happened, whether that's in a debug build or even in production. Because, as we said, at that point, there's no point in continuing. Not even no point, but it would be detrimental to continue because we can cause more damage. So that's okay. all we're going to say about contracts, I think, at this point. Yeah, so if that's how we should deal with non-recoverable errors, I've heard there's a lot of different ways that we can handle recoverable errors. So right. how should we do that? Exactly. So we're going to talk about recoverable errors, and this is really going to be the main subject of, of the rest of this talk, because there are plenty of ways that we can deal with recoverable errors. And we're going to go through all of them, one by one, more or less. Okay. Actually, there's a direction I'm going with this. So but what I want to do is uh, give you some code examples, um, and we're going to uh, have a look at how they stack up. OK, so if you come up with the examples, I'll give you some scores. OK. Tell you if your solutions are good, great, not so great, and we'll go from there, OK? That sounds fair. I think that'll make it more interesting. All right, so how, how are you going to do that? OK, so I've come up with a bunch of criteria to score different error handling methodologies. So the first thing which, as C++ developers, we hopefully all care about is overhead, performance. Right. We don't want our error handling to cost us more than it needs to. That sound OK? Yeah, we're definitely interested in the performance. But are we talking about the, uh, the overhead on the happy path or the error path? Uh, to be honest, we probably want both. Because it might be that the happy path is cheap 
and the error path is expensive or the other way around. Maybe they're the same. So yeah, you're right. We should probably split these up. So we'll have overhead on the happy path, overhead on the error path. Okay, that's good. Safety. So although I may not like to admit it, sometimes I make mistakes in my code. And if my error handling systems can help me not make those mistakes, then that's great. So I want safety. I want it to be hard to make a mistake. Always be safe. Yes. Noise. I like clean code. I want it to be concise, not so much syntactic overhead that we don't really need. So if you have a high noise score, does that mean it's going to be very noisy? No, if I score you high on noise, that means your code is good, nice and clean. OK, okay. thanks for clarifying that. Yeah. Separate paths. What I mean by that is if you look at the code, you can see, OK, right, here's the code dealing with the happy path, and here's the code dealing with the error path. They're not all like mixed in with each other and hard to tell apart. OK. Next is reasonability. Kind of similar in some ways to separate paths, but more generally, just can I look at this code and understand what it's doing? Is the error handling just so mixed in with the business logic that I have no idea what's going on? I want to be able to reason about my code. Sounds reasonable. <laughs> oh dear. Composability. Composing functions is, some people say, the essence of all programming. I think Bartosz Muski says that. Um, so we want to be able to compose our functions with just normal functions. We can often compose them, call f, call g, call h. So I want to be able to do that even when I'm handling all my errors. So you've got the composability of the functions themselves, but what about the composability of the error handling? Yeah, we want to think about that as well, because maybe our error is like a string and we want to like build up a big log of what happened. Maybe we want to do um, like handle some errors now, handle some later, or catch and rethrow something. Um, so yeah, composability of error handling as well of the kind of business logic functionality. Sounds good. Finally, I care about the message. Just like we saw earlier with the um, bean factory destruction, we want our messages to give us enough information to deal with our error, but also uh, messages which are kind of designed for the people who are going to be getting them. So this is our, my last bit of criteria. Does that all sound OK? Yeah, it's going to be a tough call, but let's see how it goes. All right, so we'll start with error codes. Everyone understands error codes. Just about every language can, can do this. Uh, and there's a few different ways we can do them. So let's just have a look. A simple example. So here we've got a function that will create a directory in the file system. So it just takes the name of a directory, returns a Boolean. Doesn't really say what Boolean is for, but most people, when they look at that, they're going to infer that the Boolean just tells us whether it succeeded or not. Just by convention, that's what we're used to. So I think it's fairly clear that that's that's our error channel. And to use that code, no surprises here. We're just going to call it and do some sort of if statement to handle the error. So we've got the happy path and the if, and the else is the error path. What could be simpler than that? And how does that stack up? Uh, I mean, it's OK. I like that this is marked. Like, you look at the declaration yeah. of this function, and as long as you work out what that bool is doing, then you kind of know that there's some kind of error handling going on here. So this is something I like about this approach. Uh, here are my scores, OK? Yeah. So the overhead is nice. Like, we're, we're just returning bools. We're doing some branching. Maybe if, if we could tune the branch prediction, maybe that would help. Use some compiler intrinsics or something like that. Yep. Um, but in general, it's pretty good. It's also easy to reason about. We're used to dealing with rules and if statements, else clauses. We know how this all works, so we can read the code and, and understand what it's doing quite easily. I do have some pretty strong objections about this, though. Thought you might. Yeah. Um, so one thing is the separate paths. Now you look at this code, and Phil is very nicely put in some, some comments for us to tell, oh, this is the happy path, and this is the error path. But if we don't have these comments, then we just see, oh, there's an if clause and else clause. Is this like, are we checking something in our business logic? Are we handling an error? We don't know unless we actually understand what's going on. So separate paths are, are not That's great. Fair. There's also a composability issue here. 
I mean, because we're returning a bool, uh, like if we wanted to re actually return something from this function, we'd have to use an out parameter or, or something else. So we can't just kind of pass objects down um, through a chain of calls. So we can't really compose okay. um, these functions. That's unfair? Yeah, that, that's fair. One thing I really do not like is the message. You know, if you, you get this, you get a bool. You say, okay, I succeeded, yes. Got what I wanted. I failed. Okay, why? I don't know. Could be anything. Uh, the last thing I want to pick up on is safety. So it's very easy for me to just, you know, return to bool, I forget about it. I just call the function, I forget to assign the bool, I forget to check it. So easy to do. But can you think of a way to solve at least that problem? Well, it's a pretty tough call. Um, I've got a few tricks up my sleeve. So, yeah, the, the safety I think we can increase if we just use the no discard attribute. We stick that on there, then that's going to force us to at least look at the return value. And in doing so, we're probably going to handle it then. So I think that's, that should increase the safety, shouldn't it? Yeah, you are right. That is better. I mean, it's quite a simple change as well. Um, makes it clearer, a lot safer to use, because now we can't forget about the return. So you're right, that does improve safety, but not really anything else. So do you have any other ideas? Yeah, OK. Well, let's, let's pick off the message then. It's, it's going to be easy, easy enough to improve that. Instead of returning a ball, how about we return an integer? And that way we can communicate different types of error codes. Is that any better? Well, I see some people like it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we said integer here, but this could be any sort of in, inter, integral type, like an enum. could be quite descriptive as well. Yeah, I mean, I'm not so keen myself. Here are my scores. Uh, so you're right, the message has improved. Uh, we can get more information about why we failed. Now that I look at my scorecard again, I kind of want to mark you down on reasonability, because uh, so looking at this, in, it's not clear that this is for error handling unless we like look at the documentation or something. So I, th I think I may have been a little bit uh, nice to you on that eight. Well, okay, but th there's one other thing we can do here. Now that we've got uh, an extra means to communicate what, what happened, we can respond to that differently. So in the case of create directory, if the directory already exists, then it couldn't create it. But that's still the happy path. So we can cope with that now. We can just stick another uh, check in there, and we can direct everything to the happy path. So that's another advantage to this one. <laughs> Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so there, there are some issues with this. Mikhail has pointed out, um, has pointed out one. And it's also when it's getting more noisy. Uh, again, we're still just dealing with it. So I think we have to look elsewhere, Phil, I'm sorry. All right, okay, well, how about if we <laughs> pass, the, pass the result of an out parameter? Well, that, that frees up the return channel now to, to address your composability needs, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Come on. Okay, I'm sorry, I just don't like out parameters. So I mean, okay, okay well, I'll give you Right, you can look at this. It still has that thing where it's marked, so there's something in the declaration. Yeah, let's see the yeah. Uh, I'm going to put your safety down because yeah. we lost that uh, notice card. That's important. Uh, it's also harder to reason about now. Um, you know, our parameters are sometimes weird. We don't know necessarily what this is doing with result unless we look at the documentation or make a wild guess. Uh, composability, fine, okay. We have the return type now that we can, can actually return something from. So I'll mark you up on that a bit, but you really have to do better. OK, well, if we want to make it safer, how about we return a ball? No, don't do that. And, <laughs> and we have an out parameter. Now we only have to check whether an error occurs. And if we want to know more, we can check the out parameter. No. <laughs> Surely. OK, I'll, I'll be. I'll be I'll be fair. I'll be trying to be objective, OK? Fine, you get your safety up again. You have the bool. No discard. Very well done. Thank you. Uh, reasonability, sure. We have the bool. We can see what it's doing a bit more. Composability, you lost your return channel again. OK, well, if you want composability, how about we just get rid of <laughs> the error returns altogether? <laughs> 
and we're sticking in the global variable. Right? You want composability, you got it. Okay, okay, okay. Erno, right. Uh, overhead, down, using, oh, sorry. There we go, right. It's unmarked, marking you down for that. Like, we can't look at this declaration and say okay, we're returning an error. Using Erno, gonna be using like thread local storage or something, so overhead. Safety, way down. Can check, forget to check Erno so easily. This is now looking noisy, it's hard to reason about, and okay, fine, we got our return um, back still. So I feel like we're just going back and forth and we're oh. not really getting anywhere. So pleasing some people, is there? Well, if you want that safety back, we can put the ball back on. <laughs> and then still set Erno. See this plenty of times. Yep, yep, yep. I'm, I'm not even gonna, no. Let, let's not do that, please. Well, you know, we lived with all of these things for a long time, and then in the 90s, we came up with something better. Solves all of these problems, doesn't it? We've got exceptions, everyone loves exceptions. But they've gotta be, they've gotta be better. Let's have a look at the same example using exceptions. So, same example, create the, we don't need anything in the signature to indicate an exception's thrown. But in the usage code, we can clearly see we've got a try catch there. We can see what's going on. That's got to be better. Isn't it? How does that score? Yes, it's got to be. Uh, well, OK, right. You got there that this is unmarked, right? That's we, true. We can't see by looking at this uh, unless we look at the documentation. I assume you would have this documented in real code, right? Of course. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you could technically use dynamic exception specifiers. Who likes dynamic exception specifiers? Zero hands, one hand, that person's lying. <laughs> if you're not lying, I'm sorry, I don't really mean it. But it, the, the general consensus is dynamic expression, uh, exception specifiers are not great. They have to do more overhead for very little benefit. Friends don't let friends use throws. Yes. Okay, so. The overhead on the happy path, and I'm assuming we're using table-based exceptions. Well, who doesn't? Many people, but okay. okay. Uh, so these are tuned specifically for the happy path. So if we don't throw an exception, this is going to be fast. So well, I'll, I'll give you good points for that. Only for exceptional cases. Yeah, so this, yeah, you're right. This is an important consideration um, because I've given you a one on the overhead for the error path. So if you throw an exception, this is gonna be super expensive comparatively because the compiler has to output a whole load of code to let you throw things of any type, throw it up as far as you can, as far as you can, unwind the stack, this costs something. So yeah, we do not want to be doing this when we're essentially doing control flow. We don't want to do that. Um, Safety, I mean, I'll technically put it up, but one thing I really do not like about exceptions in C++ are that it's very hard to write exception-safe code. We have to be very aware of what can throw and what is not going to throw, and this can make things difficult. So I'm gonna, That's true. I'm gonna give you six on safety, for now, at least. The noise, okay, it's, it's okay, yeah. But I actually do like the separate pass here, so. Yeah. Compared to what we had earlier, we had if and else statements, and it's hard to see what's good, what's bad. In this case, you know, try block and catch block have very well-defined semantics. So we look at this code and we see, okay, well, the try block is for when everything went okay. And this is when we had an exception thrown. Right. So that's very good, that's very good. We also, I mean, we can throw things of any type. We can put strings in them. So we can have essentially any message we want, which is nice. Yep, um, anytime. And then we can compose these functions because we're not, we can have our return type back. We can also compose the error handling because you know, we can rethrow things, we can have like kind of pattern matching on our, um, on our exception types. So that's, that's okay. Um, it is a bit hard to reason about for the same things I said about safety. So yeah, any ideas to make it better? Well. You mentioned the, the overhead on the error path, but that only really comes into play if you're using exceptions for control flow, doesn't it? And no one would do that, would they? Although, how are we gonna handle the all exist, already exist case? 
we just use exceptions for this, then we are literally using exceptions for control flow. We, we don't want to do that. Obviously, in this case, we could do it a different way. We could mix it with return values, or we could just take a different approach altogether. But it's, it's definitely a consideration. So that's another problem with this approach. So what the, we mentioned the, the overhead on the, uh, on the error path. And I understand everything you're saying, but it'd be nice to actually put some numbers to it. Unfortunately, they're quite difficult to, to come by. Uh, quite a few people have done different metrics which tell a different story. Uh, no one's really come up with something across the board yet. Uh, so I'm just going to pull out one that I stole from Noel Douglas from his talk last year at Meeting C++, uh, where he came up with this, uh, this chart just from his own benchmarks. So I don't read too much into it, but I think it's, it at least tells a story. What's interesting here is that the, the yellow bars are the, um, the performance of throwing an exception um, up 10 stack frames. Uh, and the other bars are different types of return code type, type error handling. Again, up the same 10, 10 stack frames. But the y-axis is exponential. So that overhead is several orders of magnitude over the return value passing approach. So no matter how you look at it, that, that is pretty significant. And other people's benchmarks sort of bear this out just in different ways. So it's, it's definitely a real problem. So much so that in, uh, in this year's uh, C++ Foundation survey, 52% of C++ programmers surveyed said that at least in part of their code bases, sometimes in all of them, exceptions are banned. Have you got any experience with that, Simon? Yeah, so I previously worked in compilers with LLVM for about five years, and no exceptions anywhere. So I mean, even if I thought all this stuff was a good idea, then I wouldn't be able to use it. Yeah, and the implications of that are actually pretty big. It means that more than half of developers are not really able to use full standard C++ because they're not able to use exceptions, which is the primary mechanism for error handling in C++. So this is, this is quite a serious situation. So what's, what's the next step? What can we do instead? There's got to be a better way, isn't there? Yeah, do you mind if I have a shot? Yeah, yeah. Can I take the podium, actually? You take the floor. OK, what could go wrong? Exactly. OK, so say we have a, a new example, OK? Say we have this, this two int function, and this is going to take a string, and we're going to try and parse an int from this string. Hopefully it contains like 42 rather than cheese. That sound That's okay? Good example, because this is something you might want to do speculatively. If you don't really want to pay the cost of exceptions if, if it fails. Yeah, exactly. We might want to read ahead or try and do something with a string and then realize, oh, it's not an int, it's actually cheese. So do something else. So throwing here is essentially using exceptions for control flow, bad. See what I love, people who may be sick of me talking about this, but I love optional, it's great. Ooh. So if you're not familiar with optional, uh, it's essentially an optional int says, I'm either an int or I'm nothing, empty. So in this case, uh, if we get our int, we just return it, and this is gonna be the value of our optional. And if we cannot find an int, it's an empty string or it's cheese, then we return an empty optional. This is std null opt. Okay? Okay. How's that look? I like the direction this is going in. It's got some promise. Uh, what about the, uh, the usage? You're right, I didn't cover this. The, the, the usage looks kind of like this. Um, we could call this function, get an optional out, and then we can check whether we got a value and do something with it. And if we didn't, we print out not an int or log mm. to a file, something like that. Does this seem reasonable? Yeah, well, let, let's take it through step by step then. So the overhead's pretty good. I'd say it's a slight overhead over return codes, but in the same sort of ballpark, doing the same sort of thing. Safety's pretty good because <clears throat> now it's much clearer that the return type is expressing um, either the, the value or the absence of a value. It's, it's literally built into the type. So safety is pretty good, although it's not perfect because you could still dereference the, uh, the optional without checking, and then you're into undefined behavior. So still shoot yourself in the foot. But it's still quite noisy as well. As well as this extra wrapper type, you've got um, the, the control flow to handle the, the error condition at the call site. So you're still mixing in standard control flow with, with error handling, unfortunately, plus all the dereferencing. So you, you pay a bit there, and you don't really have the separate paths for error handling. Uh, but it's much easier to reason about. Again, because we're using an expressive type 
to represent what it is we're doing. And we're not blocking the return channel, so we've got reasonable composability, although we do have to do a bit of extra work, so it's not a perfect score. But really, optional in this case is like a glorified Boolean. We're only saying whether the thing was there or not, but not why. So is there anything you can do to improve that? Yeah, you're right. Uh, it's maybe optional is just not quite the right type for this. So if we really want to have a reason why something didn't return anything, maybe we need something like a variant. So we could return a variant event instead string, and then our int is what we return if we actually found something, and our std string is like a error report if we didn't find anything. How's that? Well, I like the use of a, a if initializer. This is, this is better in some ways. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you that you can now uh, tell me why the error occurred. But, you know, I'm really gonna have to mark it down on, on safety and noise because I really, really don't like this, this usage code. Yeah. Um, I, I have to I read that very carefully it. to yeah. see what's going on there. Uh, it's just much too noisy. Uh, it doesn't even say anything about error handling, let alone the happy path uh, to me. Uh, you've still got a wrapper type in there. Um, and it's, it's no longer obvious even that, that that's what the semantics are, the, that the string is representing an error. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't say anything about error there. So, um, but you can put any message you like, so, so there is that. It's going in the right direction, but I think we've got a bit more work to do. Okay. Well, maybe even variant isn't the right type. Maybe we want something which more clearly expresses we have two types. One of them is the well, expected hold on. Before type. you get there, I think we can do a little bit better with the, the usage code. Maybe you're right, actually. Should we use, we could use, I mean, we could use visit, but that would look really weird. No, don't do that. Uh, yeah, so we could use get if, I guess. That does clean it up a bit, yeah. But yeah, slightly better noise score, but that's about it. So I think you're right, we do need to look elsewhere. So you carry on. Okay, yeah, so we want something which clearly expresses we have the expected type and the unexpected type. So anyone who is in Andre's talk now knows exactly what I'm gonna say. It's the expected. I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. You're welcome, be here all week. <laughs> okay, so this is very similar, but um, Expected is kind of designed so that returning the expected type is very easy. We just return the int. And returning the unexpected type, you need to really, you need to try, you need to make it obvious. Um, so that's how we would write our to int function. And then our usage code down here is way better. So are we, are we done? Well, it's amazing how much difference just using a slightly better aligned type um, makes this. It's doing basically the same thing, but now I can, I can read about this much, much better. So, yeah, I'd put the, uh, the safety up. It's, it's much safer to use for that reason. Um, it's a bit less noisy. I mean, yeah, we've still got some of the same problems. Um, but it doesn't solve the, the separate paths issue. We're still mixing the happy path and the, and the error path together. But it's, it's a big step in the right direction. Um, I, I, can, I can live with this, I think. Have you got any more? Well, maybe we need to think more about the composability in separate paths. These are things you've pretty strongly marked me down. That separate yeah. path is harsh. But well, you did it to me. Sorry. Uh, OK, maybe we can look for influence elsewhere. Um, so let's say instead of having just one function, we have two functions. Um, I, I want to go hard on this composability now. So we have our um, to int function, and we have our divide function. This to int is the same as before, essentially. Divide is new. And it's like a safe integer division function. So it checks if the denominator is zero so we don't end off in undefined behavior land. So we don't like being in undefined behavior land. So relatively simple, yeah? Looks good to me. Yeah. OK, so we can look at what our codes would be um, if we just used sit expected and if and else statements, this is starting to look not yeah, great. I, I take that back when I said I could live with that. Yeah. Not sure I could. So we could look to functional programming languages, okay. which often have this concept of a, a map. So what map does is you give it your expected, you give it a function, and it will call that function on the contained value only if it exists. So here we're trying to multiply by two. 
So if there is a value, it'll get multiplied by two and returned, wrapped in and expected. And if there wasn't a value, then we just push through the error. So this deals with the case where we want to just have a function which operates on the values. But if we have things which return expected themselves, that we have a bunch of functions which we want to just chain together, and they all return expecting, so they could all have some kind of disappointment, then we need a way of composing these as well. So what we usually have is something like and then, sometimes called bind. Um, so what this essentially does is just, it's like a map, but we'll, we're gonna end up with like an expected of expected. And if we, if we have five functions which we want to compose, we're gonna have an expected of expected of expected of expected of expected. So this and then just joins them all together, flattens it all into one expected object. So in the end, once we've um, done our division, we just end up with a single level. So um, this is really nice for composability. So it lets us expect the expected? Yes. So now this is the code we had before. And if we now use uh, map and then, it looks like this. How's that? Okay, there's, there's definitely less code. I'll give you that. Um, looking at the scores, well, it's safer because instead of having to manually uh, unwrap the expected, which you could do without checking, that's now done for you by your helper functions. So we're only ever dealing with the unwrapped values when they exist. So yeah, that, that's good, that's, that's a lot safer. And we're actually starting to see a separation of paths emerging here. We've got all the happy path at the top and the error handling at the bottom. So that's going in the right direction. Uh, it's even composable because now we're separating the error handling out. Uh, your functions can compose and the error handling itself can compose. So that's a yeah, top marks there. But it's still noisy. And it's not just noisy, but you have to contort the way you even think about this because now the, the initial values are going in, in the middle and then the flow is sort of spiraling out and you have to sort of awkwardly nest the functions and I'm not even sure how to format this. So yeah, I can't really say I like it on that, on that ground. So yeah. what do you think you can do about that? Yeah, and I guess it's even worse. Like if you have a bunch of things you're gonna be doing, calling map and and then on, then this is just gonna eventually span the entirety of this screen, right? Um, it's a big screen. Yeah, it is a big screen. So I guess what we'd like to do is just take all this inside out nested nonsense, flatten it out and make it just a, a nice clean line of function calls. Be a neat trick if you can do it. Yeah. Uh, so we could take a leaf out of Range's book. Ranges likes to compose things and they use operator overloading. So if we have, don't worry too much about the implementation up the top, but we essentially have types um, called map and and then, which do all the, um, all the work in this um, operator overload. So you can then just say, to int, and then do this, map this, and it all just goes nicely down the line. That is a lot better. Um, yeah, but a lot less noisy, so I'll, I'll put that up. It's not perfect, because we've still got a lot of the, the boilerplate there, uh, all, the, all the Lambda stuff. It's not really anything to do with the happy path, but we're, you know, I can live with that. That's um, it's a much nicer control flow. We can see the value going in at the top, and we can see it sort of flowing step by step through a, like a pipeline of, of calls. Um, one problem though is that this, uh, this pipe operator, is, we're really sort of abusing the operator a bit and we might run into precedence issues. So um, although we haven't put it there, I, I've maybe even put the safety down a bit because of that. Yeah. Can we fix yeah. that at all? There's actually a proposal in the works at the moment. Um, anyone who was in here, the last panel, Izzy Muerte, is working on a proposal for um, a workflow operator which has correct precedence, so it makes all of this work nicely. And it means you essentially have the same code, but it means that some edge cases do the right thing. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, I think that's, that's really getting there now. We're, we're getting some pretty high scores across the board. Um, there's just a bit of noise left to, to deal with. So I think to, to do any better than this, we're gonna have to start sort of thinking outside of C++ a bit, because 
you know, what we, what we actually have here, what we're dealing with, technically speaking, is a monad. Because we've got a value that we're putting inside a box, and we've got operations for putting in and out of the box and binding those things together. And that's really all a monad is. And now we've invoked the monad word, well, we can look at ways we can deal with that, because functional programming languages do, do this all the time. It's their bread and butter. So let's go right to the top. Let's look at Haskell. OK, right. You're, you're going to have to take the podium again. OK. So Haskell has this thing called do notation. And it really is just syntactic sugar, as it says here in the Haskell wiki. Let's uh, see if I can get this thing to work. Oh, here we go. So the important bit is these semicolons here. They're not like C++ semicolons. And you may have heard the, the expression programmable semicolons. This is what it means. What this signifies to the compiler is when you see the semicolon within a do expression is rewrite it to use the, these map and bind operators. It's the same as the, the things we were just looking at, it's just spelled slightly differently. So it can just directly translate what's at the top to what's at the bottom. So we can get rid of all the, the lambda craft and just write what looks like imperative code, but it's still going to sprinkle through that all the, the, the logic for binding and get moving in and out of uh, something like expected in this case. So I think that would help a lot. Yeah, I guess, but I, I don't really see how we would actually do this in C++. Do you have any ideas? Well, obviously, we don't have language support for it at the moment. But let's have a, just a little thought experiment. If we put something like this into the language, what would it actually look like? So here's the example that you, you left with, with the, uh, using the pipe operator, so sticking to, to what we have. Now, if we had something like do notation, um, set aside for a moment that do is already a keyword. So imagine this is a Haskell-like do block. Now it looks much more like regular code. It's much easier to think and reason about this, I think. And the semicolons are just C++ semicolons. But imagine that's, that's the point that we're going to insert those operators. Now what's interesting is, is having done that, we've already got a good separation here between the, the happy path and the error path. It's just a little bit of a happy path stuck at the bottom there. But if our do block returned an object that we could call a method on, that took a lambda, let's call it catch. The lambda re returns the error, so only called in the case of an error. We can stick our error path there. And this is starting to look familiar, isn't it? So I think we're, we're getting, getting somewhere, but we, we've still got that do keyword. Yeah, I mean, I do like it. I really do. But you're right, do is already a word. So can you come up with a better one? Well, I'll try. <laughs> Let's just make it try, because that, that completes the symmetry, doesn't it? We've now got something that looks very similar to what we have in C++ exceptions right now, except we've been just seen this translates back directly to where Simon got to with the, uh, the, the SID expected based error handling with all of the, the good properties that that had and none of the bad properties that exceptions have currently. Since we're getting the compiler to rewrite stuff for us, we may as well go all the way with the, with the catch keyword, uh, make that a fully fledged keyword. So that's pretty good. And that, what about the, um, the functions that we're calling? So we're currently returning um, stood expected or something like it and using std make it unexpected. Again, we're getting the compiler to do the transformations for us, so let's make it a bit more customized. Instead of returning std ex expected, we'll say it froze. That's not the old style froze, this is a new thing. Um, and then it just looks like it returns a double, so it's much clearer which things are the normal values and which bits are to do with error handling. And likewise, instead of returning uh, an unexpected, we just throw it. And because we're in a function marked as froze, the compiler knows just to rewrite that to return make unexpected or something similar. So I think we're, we're really getting somewhere here. What, what do you think, Simon? I think we are, yeah. This is looking good. I'll, I'll bring my scores up. So I mean, the overhead is really good here because, as you said, we're just like passing values around under the covers. It looks like we're throwing things, but really it's just mapped to what's going to be really fast code under the covers. So the overhead's going to be good here. Safety, I brought this up before when we talked about exceptions. Mm -hmm. It's hard to reason about 
which of these expressions could throw or not without looking at every declaration for every function you stick in the try block. Um, so I'm going to mark you down on safety there. Yeah, did have that it was unmarked up there. Ah, that's probably one. <laughs> um, what speaker room? For the noise, this is looking good. Like, uh, we're just writing normal C++ code, and it's just being mapped to something which is doing more. I really like that. The separate paths are very clear, you know, try, catch, just like with um, today's exceptions. Again, reasonability, for the same reasons as, as the, the safety, it's hard to reason about what's gonna throw. But I will give you full marks for composability and, and message, because we can put any string up there that we like. I guess, can we throw anything we like? Well, almost, although I've put a string there, in practice, if we were gonna do something like std error, it would have to return something of fixed size so that we can um, just have the, the values propagating. So really it'll just be um, an error code and then maybe a pointer to something that we could put something dynamic in if we needed. Okay, so I mean, yeah, my one issue with this is the safety and the reasonability. Uh, if I try something just really small, simple change. Okay, go for it. If we just add try in here, right, if we have to mark these function calls with try. If your function says it throws, then you have to mark the call with try. Then the compiler can check this and make sure you've done it right. So now if I forget to say, oh look, this function could throw something, the compiler says, no, you need to think about this. I'm not gonna let you forget. And that's really nice for reasonability and safety. I guess even, I mean if this is built into the compiler, could this be even faster than just using if and else? Well, I think it could, because although we talked about it mapping to something like std expected, now the compiler knows about it, and it can do more optimizations. So in fact, there's a, uh, a single bit in the, um, in the return channel that's in a register that's not currently used. It could be used to indicate whether it's an error or not. And you're gonna get that basically for free, almost. And even the, uh, the ifs involved uh, will often be optimized away by the branch predictor. So I would say we could even put the overhead up to a 10. You might argue maybe it's a nine and a half, but I think that's pretty good. We've got almost 10, 10 out of 10 across the board with that. I, I would really love to have someone like this in the language. I don't know you, Simon. Yeah, definitely. Actually, should we just start writing a paper on it? Well, you know what? It's already been done. Ah. <laughs> this is basically what Herb Sutter's zero overhead deterministic exceptions is all about a.k.a. static exceptions, a.k.a. herbceptions. <laughs> if you haven't read this paper, you, you really should, because it, it goes through all of the, the things that we've been talking about and much more in a lot more depth. It, it's really compelling. Uh, what we really wanted to convey here is that this is not just exceptions done a bit better. This is rethinking it from scratch, looking at where we got to with something like stood expected or, or boost outcome, and how would we make that easier to use in the language without Getting, uh, without losing any of the benefits. So we've ended up with something that looks somewhat similar to uh, exceptions that we have now, but with none of the downsides and all of the upsides. At least that, that's what we think, so we'll leave it up to you to decide. Yeah, so I think we should definitely be looking to put something like this in C++. I think the try part that I just added is like an optional um, part to the paper, but I think that's definitely the right way to go. Yeah, I agree with you there. Yeah, so I think we should be thinking about this and accepting it into the standard because what could possibly go wrong? Thank you. Okay, we'll take questions now. Yes, microphone would be great, thank you. Oh, what could uh, possibly can we have go wrong? AV down here, please? If anyone. Okay, just speak. We'll repeat questions. It's fine. Okay. So there's an argument to be made that sometimes you don't want to have error handling separate. Like uh, Andre said, sure. yes. said yesterday that uh, sometimes you want local error handling, and sometimes error handling is part of the business logic. It's not just drop out, revert everything, drop the error, and, and I'm done. You have to handle it and be resilient. So I think the question was, um, 
I was referring back to something that Andre said yesterday, that sometimes you want local error handling. That, that means rather than it branching out to a catch block, you want to handle it there and then at the return site like you would with a return value, which is a, it's an excellent point. And this proposal doesn't preclude that, because as we said, it, it maps directly back to returning something. And I think it's an optional part of the proposal, if I remember rightly, that you have a facility to, to map it back to that and deal with it there and then. But I don't, don't think it's actually uh, a non-optional part of the proposal, but that's something I'd be supportive of. Yeah. I know some people have some different... Yeah, you could definitely things. design it such that like, if you don't want to use the try and catch with the, the try expressions, then maybe there's a way to say, OK, I want to explicitly like, get the expected like object from this thing and then handle it right there and then. Um, so yes, it's a design point. Yeah. Thank you. Next question. Uh, I think the mic is on now, actually. Okay. Yep, it's on. Um, so std expected and static exceptions are wonderful and they're awesome, but they still fall into this error handling paradigm of I either compute a result or I have an error. Right? They're very much a maybe type from functional programming, um, but there are still corner cases where that doesn't cover everything we need. Right. Um, in particular, this has come up in some discussions around like the networking TS with uh, composed I/O operations, where I'm making say repeated calls to say like read or write system calls to either um, fill buffers or drain a series of buffers, um, and it might fail in the middle, right? Because I have to make repeated calls to actually complete the whole operation, and in that case, there's code that's um, let's say particularly correctness sensitive we're communicating both the failure reason and the total number of bytes transferred so far is absolutely necessary, right? And it seems right now the discussion is that we're still falling into this world of a dual API where we have a std error code output parameter. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Um, my suspicion is that there's another library type hiding out there for us to discover like std expected. Yeah, but so we haven't been clever enough to come up with it yet. Yeah, it does seem like what, what you're um, thinking about is something like you have an expected type and an unexpected type, some kind of audit trail, like um, something which is um, accumulating information about how we got to this current state. It's like state. the writer monad. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so you, you're, you're trying to essentially compose the either monad with the writer monad. Um, yeah. And yeah, so I think there's, there's definitely some library design stuff you could do to solve that problem. It would be like a, a very specific uh, library solution um, to that thing. If we, if we had, um, there is a paper for a kind of generalized monadic framework for C++. Mm. Um, I guess that would help in some ways because then you could just nest these monads together and then have everything just work so long as you kind of understood what you were doing. Right. Um, so that might help, uh, but yeah, that's a lot of, um, that's a long way away. So yeah, I understand people have these problems like today. Yeah. And yeah, right now we have to craft library solutions for these things. So yeah, I think that's a really good point and that, um, that if we build this into the language, this is solving this problem and not necessarily everyone's problem. Mm -hmm. So yeah, thank you cool. for that. Thanks. Plus uh, my hot take on that is that what we're talking about here is error handling. Um, and you can really, imagine really something like what I'm talking error about error. decaying to a yeah. stood expected, right? If you, yeah. let's say so at the top level, I really only care about success or failure, but maybe intermediately, I really do need to care about all the fine details. But yeah. Yeah, and we have curry routines, which is a slightly more generalized approach to a similar set of problems. So that, that also may yeah. make things. Yeah. Thanks. Hey, next question. Could you go back to try to in, try divide slide? Which one, sorry? Uh, this one, yes. Okay, this one. Uh, does divide function with this definition uh, support erroneous uh, denominator? I, I don't see if, if to int uh, returned error in i, well, uh, does divide support somehow such error? So you mean if, if to int um, returns a, a yeah. string, like it had the, the error path, what does divide do? Yes. In that case, divide's never called. Uh, it's essentially like a, an early exit type thing. So when you're, if, if you think about this, if we go back to um, the pipeline code, it might be clearer. Uh, here we go. Right, so these, uh, these calls here, like if this, this, if this and then returns a, um, an unexpected value, 
then this map is a no-op. It just returns what it was given. So this, uh, when we map it back to, to this example, then it's doing the same thing. Um, th this divide is just a, I, I mean, the, this is in a different order than that example, but it's the same kind of thing. If one of these fails, then the rest is just a no-op. Okay, thanks. Next question, who was first? Sorry, thanks. One comment and one question. Uh, the comment is that the examples, and therefore I suspect, I'm not sure whether the testing uh, is fair with regards to exceptions as they are today and the other forms because we have all these things surrounding stack unwinding, uh, which most of the other cases seem to kind of ignore. Uh, like, how do you jump out of this scope? It's not really apples to apples. Uh, and the question with regards to one of your later slides, I'm guessing the one, um, say top. One of the last ones, probably, um, is whether the, the throws one. The throws one? Yes. Uh, but when we write throws in the um, declaration. Yes. Um, is it? This one. Yes. So this is kind of like the start of it, but the question really is, is this function implicitly no accept? Uh, That's a very interesting question, and I think it was debated on SG14 when this, this came up. Um, if I remember rightly, I think, I think we're roughly divided on, on whether it should imply that or not. Because um, it would seem a bit redundant to put throws and no accept, in fact, a bit odd. But on the other hand, it sort of makes some, some logical sense as well, and I can't remember where that ended up. So yeah. I'd like to, to look into that again. And there's a lot of stuff in the, the paper about, uh, you know, like, um, transformations between static and dynamic exceptions. Like what happens yeah. if you uh, if you have a function which is marked throws and a dynamic exception tries to exit that? Like can you convert it to a static exception? Maybe in some cases. Do you have to go the other way sometimes? Maybe. So there's there's extra stuff in the paper about that as well. Yeah, they should interoperate, and we, we didn't really cover that. But yep. um, whether you whether that's specifically making throws implies no accept. I think we were leaning towards yes, but I don't think it was conclusive. Uh, but it may have, I haven't been, um, been on the call since then, so I'm not sure if that's been clarified. Yeah. Next, next question. How long we got? Yeah, still got a few more. Um, does this uh, cover constructors as well? Can, they that, throw, can constructors throw in this new way? Constructors and uh, operators, yes. Yeah. So you couldn't do that with the um, uh, still expected based the re returns because you don't have that return channel. Yeah. But because the compiler knows about this, yes, it can do that. So it's as if it's created a new return channel for you. Yeah, and another quick question. You mentioned um, uh, heap exhaustion is kind of a separate topic, but you never really elaborated on that? Yeah, um, but the way this evolved, we didn't really come yeah, back yeah. to that. But the, the whole reason that's significant is because if you think about it, the majority of uses of exceptions are to do with the heap exhaustion, or the majority of defensive coding against it. If you take that out of the picture, then most of what's left either would be a contract, that's why we talked about that, or it'd be well suited to static exceptions. So there'd be almost no reason left to, to need dynamic exceptions, or they would still have them. Um, that, that could possibly be the only um, use we'd have left for them. Mm -hmm. The significance is that if we, if we did adopt this, and uh, the standard library made most of its uh, logic errors into contracts, then there'd be no dynamic exceptions left in the standard library, which would be quite a nice place to be, because then all that, that those 52% of people that uh, can't currently say that they're using standard C++ will be able to use standard C++ with F no exceptions. And then just the board on bad alloc. <laughs> Sorry? And then just the board on bad, bad alloc, I guess. Right, well, for most people, um, it's not gonna matter. Uh, if by default, um, bad alloc actually terminates, but you, you can still use the, um, uh, the, the version of new that uh, returns a, a boolean, yeah. um, or a null, um, then those people that care can use that, and those people that don't, they'll, they'll be fine. All right, thanks. Thanks, any other questions? Yes, we've got maybe time for one more last question. Yeah. Okay, so uh, do, in this model, do I have to put a try cage for every function that might potentially throw? Or 
is it will be just like with dynamic exceptions that will, it will be propagate up the stack? Yeah, so this comes back to the uh, like um, transformations between static and dynamic exceptions. Uh, there's a lot of wording around that. Um, to fully answer that question would take longer than time we have. But no, I mean, do, do I have, have to I put in try catch every function that might potentially throw? Yeah, I think the simple answer is, in terms of try catch, it's pretty much the same as dynamic exceptions. Yeah. If you miss them, the error will propagate through to the next level, which means that your function has to be marked froze. Oh. That, that's the requirement. Okay, so, for example, if I have a contract that uh, I pass an int and I use it as a denominator for divide, and I have a contract in my function that it's not a zero, but I pass it to divide where it may throw, so I have to throw, but I know that I will never throw. Can I, like, how do I, like, tell a compiler that it will never happen because I have a contract? How do I connect this to strategies of error handling? Um, if I'm getting you right, I think you would have to wrap that in a try catch, and the, the catch would uh, abort or something. Yeah, but I know from, like, but imagine, I have a contract that it will never right, be zero. Yeah, so. I understand. Imagine, because this translates back to, uh, you know, imagine it's returning a um, stood expected. Well, if you're calling a function that you know will never return um, an unexpected, but it returns stood expected or something, you've still got to unwrap it. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's the same thing. The, the try catch is just doing the unwrapping for you. That, that's really all it, all it is. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Is this going to be short? Uh, yeah, it's lightning fast. Is SG1 for, uh, sorry, is SG14 done with this paper and can, when can evolution start taking it apart? <laughs> <laughs> I think, asking, yeah. asking somebody from evolution so that I can start taking it apart. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, SG14, um, very strongly in support of the paper in general. There's definitely some, some bike shedding over the details, which is why so much of the paper is optional. Yeah, ask um, Herb. Uh, right, because, because uh, like, the, as a general note, SG14 shouldn't be very, uh, uh, shouldn't care about the bike shedding too much because evolution is going to the, do that bike shedding again, so. Yeah, maybe uh, bike shedding is the wrong word. It's at the high level, it's, it's more about, yeah, yeah. should it I have mean, this major feature or not, like, yeah, like the tricky yeah, word. Right. So, just, I just mean don't spend, spend too much time on details because they are going yeah. to change. Okay, yeah, thank you very much.